Today, I want to talk to us about as a subject that, you know, we're talking about being ready. And even Denver in his offering, it's funny how God always does that. Hey, he speaks to you and then he starts speaking and, and then the next minute you're like, are you reading my notes? But um, the thing that I've been thinking about this morning is like how God wants to use you. Who wants to be used by God? Now, you need to be careful when you say that because we don't get to choose and say, God, I want you to use me in this area. But how many of us would actually like to say, God, I know you've got great, great plans for me. If I were to ask you that, do you believe that God has got great plans for you? Do you believe that he has got your life in a line of events to impact a whole lot of other people's lives around you? Are you aware of that? Because that puts responsibility on us. And I was thinking we've had... um. A friend staying with us this week. Some of you have met him. And he, he, I was saying to Johnny and Lizzie, because they're childhood friends, is that he didn't come to prayer meeting and he was staying in our house. He didn't come to church because he had to leave today. And he, he just wasn't around. We didn't have those open sort of, Jesus is the way. Let me tell you the Bible because you've walked through my house. And let me, you know, people have that expectation of having a Bible on your table. If we had one, you wouldn't find it because I know a whole lot of toys, but anyway, it's, um, it's that expectation of when people meet Christians, what are they going to see? And you think it's going to have to have a conversation, sit down, let me give you the A to B to Z of everything. And this guy, we didn't have that. And I was talking to Johnny and I was so aware, we've been saying, let's be a city on a hill. Let's be people that shine. And we read these scriptures, but what does it look like? Now, my prayer is that this guy that has, been, has actually seen some of you guys, he walked in after prayer meeting, and some of us were still having coffee. So he got to speak to people. It's different, right? Something has to be different. And so that whole thing of going, God, did we miss an opportunity? Because Lizzie walks in and goes, are you coming to prayer meeting? Can we pray for you? Can we do this? And she goes straight in. She's, that's, that's on her life, right? And I thought, God, did we miss an opportunity? In my heart, I'm like, actually, no. Because have you ever heard that saying is that under, in, in all things, in all circumstances, preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard that? Think about that. Sometimes you can't go in and start preaching a, the whole message to somebody, but by simply living a life, they're going to know something's different about you. By the way you respond, by the way you, you react to somebody, by the way you just extend a helping hand, by the way you lend 20p to somebody. In this country, it's a big deal to lend a little bit of money to somebody it's really, you know, in South Africa, they're like, oh, I don't have enough money. Oh, yes, 10 rand. They're like, thanks. And they put it in their pocket. In this country, it's, yes, 20p. Okay, I, I, I'm sure I can make it up in five pence. You're like, it's 20p, you know. But that makes an impact on somebody. So this week, going forward, don't underestimate you just shining where you're at, how you're speaking to people that you're working with, how you're serving, how you're responding, how you, your, your honesty, your, you know, all those things. That's shining. And so I getting back to this friend he spent a week in our home and we never had one conversation yet he saw how we dealt with our children he saw that church was our priority he saw that God was you know worship in the mornings and stuff that's all I can do and that's not changing you can't put it on for when people come in because they'll know the difference but he had to be part of our family and so my prayer is that he would have seen something different because he's never been exposed to it like when you say prayer he looks at you like I don't actually know how to respond to it, so I walk out the door. Some people have never, ever been exposed to church. Some people have never, ever, ever even been told they can pray. They don't even know what that is. And so he comes into a situation where he's in, I said to Denver, does he know that I'm preaching tomorrow? Because he had to get to the airport at 3 o'clock this morning, and Sunday mornings are like um, really hectic in our house. So I was like, I don't want to be unkind. If you feel... You need to take him to the airport, then do it. But otherwise, can we book him a cab? <laughs> <laughs> so last night we were booking cabs. And, um, and I just said to Denver, it's just, I know, like, it's not great coming to church and your kids are fighting and, you know, you haven't even showered yet because you've got everyone else ready and it's, this is your job, you know, and you're pitching up and you're like, okay, we're all okay. So I said to Denver, just in case. And then at about midnight, Bailey kicked off. And I was like, thank you, Jesus, that the cab is coming at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> But anyway, that was the ad break. So what I was thinking about is, is the fact that I believe God wants to do something special in all of our lives. And, and we, we have to be in that place. And so my title or my, my thought process is that, are you available? Are you available to, for God to say, 
I'm going to do this through your life this week. Are you available for him to say, you know that thing you trusted me for in your finances? Well, I'm going to prove to you. He doesn't have to prove to us, but he can. He goes, I want to just show myself faithful in that place, bigger than what you can think of. And so I'm going to read two different accounts, one in the Old Testament, one in the, in the New Testament about people that have been available to God. Because when you see just, when you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, how he speaks to you. And I don't know if I shared it in prayer meeting or, or over here, but we went to a baby dedication. Did I tell you that? That was a prayer meeting conversation. Was it a church one? Anyway, you need to hear it. We went to a baby dedication and the people requested, the people who went to just said, look, if you've got anything you're feeling for our children or a word for us to encourage us, please bring it. And my eyes were open because people, you sort of come there and you think, okay, I'm going to get there and the pastor or the elder or the person that's heading this conversation or this meeting is going to say it all. I have to listen and I go home. And the thing that struck me when I was there is that that's who we are. That's who you are called to be. When you come and you say, you know what, God, do you have anything that you want to say through my life to this child? Now, this is the dedication. So people could have waited on the Lord and and stuff. But the fact that everybody that was there had a word to encourage the parents, had something that they wanted to speak over the children, had a scripture. And I was like, God, if we listen, you will speak. If we want to hear from you, you will tell us something. And so that's the part where it is. We're saying, God, you've never spoken to me. Well, have you actually said, God, I want you to. I want you to speak to me. Have you ever said, God, I don't know what to pray for somebody. You're like, God, well, I don't know what to pray, but you do. So I'm just going to pray in faithfulness. Like thinking about this person, I just commit them to you. Because he wants us to be that sensitive to his spirit. So if you go to in Acts 8, it's a story about Philip. He's one of the disciples. I didn't plan this. Joel um, preached on the disciples last week. It was a brilliant message. You have to listen to it. So if you're in Acts 8 verse 29, it's about Philip and the Ethiopian. Now Philip is one of the, um, the, the disciples. And what's happened is they're all in, I think, Samaria. And there's a lot going on in Samaria. And there's sorcerers and there's like a whole, like you could imagine the World Cup rugby. Everything's happening. They're praying for people, healing for people, casting out demons, all of that. And in his heart, God goes, Philip, I need you to leave this place. And I need you to go to the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And so he goes. So let me read it to you. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the, um, of Candace, which is a queen of Ethiopia at the time. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah out loud. And then he said to him, do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked, how can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his de- descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. In the message it says, G- Philip made the most of the opportunity or jumped at the opportunity and preached the gospel to him. You sort of think, how can you preach the gospel to somebody out of the book of Isaiah? But everything in this Bible points to who God is, what Jesus' plan was, and us to be reconciled with him. So then Philip began with the passage and told him about the good news. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? Or the other, another translation says, what should I do? Like, is there anything hindering me from being baptized? Like right now, right now, there's water. Can I be baptized? And, and basically the story goes on where Philip gets up, stops the chariot and then both Philip and the eunuch go down to the water and Philip baptizes him and when they come out of the water the spirit of the Lord suddenly takes Philip away but listen to this he went on his way rejoicing but the eunuch didn't never saw him again and um, however it didn't even 
defaze him because he received what he wanted to receive if you read different um, translations. And when I read that, that, that passage of scripture, there's two things, two different things you've got to see here is that Philip is one person where God can use you or the Ethiopian where somebody is waiting for you to be obedient to what God wants to do. We sing songs every single week going, God loves us. It never, his love never fails. It never runs out. He will go further than anyone has ever gone before. He has gone further. And he hears the cry of every single person. But what's happening is Philip is in the middle of something massive happening in Samaria. And you think, okay, I need to stay here because this is where the harp's at. This is where it's happening. This is where it's front and center stage. This is where the big need is. And God takes him away from where you think you could do something great and puts him in the back of nowhere on a desert road. Now, it's uncommon to go down to that desert road because there nothing really happened. It was uninhabited. So you sort of think, God, why would you take away me away from an army of people where I could just walk through the crowds and, and minister to people to a place where we don't even know if there's anybody coming? But because he was sensitive and because he was available and he was like, okay, I'll go to this road, he went. Now, the thing about this road is when you think about it, what would you do if God said to you, you know what, I need you to just go and make tea for somebody in the back office? You know what? Maybe this conversation, it's not going to be when you're standing talking to your peers. It's going to be how you treat your children behind the scenes. Maybe it's going to be a place where there's no limelight, where there's nothing to achieve there, and no one can see you there. And often, that can be even in our serving in, in, in church. There are people who are unseen. Chairs just get put out every Sunday. Cakes are on the table. Kids' church is prepared. And nobody knows how much work goes into those things. And often, we've gone, you know what? I don't want to serve because I'm going to miss out on the word over here. And God's going, well, what if you realized what you're doing behind the scenes where nobody can, can see you, what you're doing with your finances, how you're sowing, how you're praying for people. Nobody can see it, but that's where he He's going to use you to change a person's life. I wonder if we got that, how different we would be when we're serving. When you're pouring into children, into kids' church, and you're not sitting here and you sort of think, okay, is it worth it? It's just my turn on the roster. At least I'm not on for another four weeks, six weeks. And he's going, many things that are unseen are like really vital to what he's doing in our lives. Sometimes you could think it's not worth doing. Or what's this little bit of encouragement going to do to somebody? What's this little bit of given? What's this little bit of nothing going to achieve anyway? And so many times we stop ourselves from doing something because we discount its value or we overlook it as not important. It's a road from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's uninhabited. God, what can you achieve on this road? But he went and he left the excitement and he goes. And as he goes, look at how the story involves. God doesn't give details. Now I'm prepping this, right? And I'm busy writing all these things down. And the next minute, T.D. Jake interrupts me while I'm preparing. T.D. Jakes is a massive um, sort of evangelist, Bible teacher. He's been around for generations and he interrupts me on Periscope. I told you, Periscope is bad because it just pops up whenever people feel like talking to you. So I wasn't going to listen. But then I did because I needed a break. <laughs> And, um, and he starts talking straight like into the points that I'd written down. I said to Denver, you've got to come and see this. This is what, where my notes are. This is where T.D. Jakes interrupted me, and these are where my notes are carrying on. And he's talking, and he's just encouraging people. He goes, um, it's Saturday morning. He's in America. Does anyone know who T.D. Jakes is? Okay, he's, he's, a, big, he's a big black African-American that talks really like, you know, with hankies. They do the whole like temple thing. I want to go there. And so... He's, he starts talking and goes, he was just thinking and he, he wasn't going to go on Periscope and he never comes on Periscope, but he just felt like he needed to speak into somebody's life about God doesn't give you details. Isn't that good? If you're waiting for details, you're not going to get it from God. He just gives you the faith to be obedient one step at a time. And he says, I don't know why I'm even telling you this, but somebody needs to hear this. Now, there's 3,000 people watching him. Just literally within seconds, there's 3,000, 3,500 people all over the world watching what he's saying. And so he starts speaking. But the, if you, and I was so encouraged. I'm like, yes, no, he doesn't. He doesn't give you details. He wants you to be obedient. He wants you to live in open spaces. But look how he does it. He says to Philip, go to that street. Go to that road. 
He didn't tell him there was going to be a eunuch. He didn't tell him that he was going to explain the gospel to him. He didn't tell him, and then you're going to baptize somebody, and then you're going to just be transported like nobody's ever been transported before. Because then we would all rush, right? Like that's an exciting trip. But he had to go in faith. And when he got there, when he was sensitive enough to take the step to go to that road, God spoke to him. Then the eunuch comes past. As he's standing, he goes, okay, so there's a eunuch coming past. God goes, be sensitive, stay a while, listen. He's reading the prophet of Isaiah. Okay, what about that? He's like, he doesn't know what he's reading. Ask him. So then the next detail comes. So he chases down a chariot. I mean, that's quite impressive. Chases down a chariot, catches up with him, jumps up onto the chariot and goes, hey, do you know what you're reading? And the guy goes, well, how will I know? I was laughing this week because we grew up on something called Salty. Salty, the singing songbook. Who knows who Salty, the singing songbook is? Do you? Well, Brendan has been listening to it as well. This funny, funny. We did. If you missed out on prayer meeting before church, we did a whole little tune duet. You missed out. And, um, and it's the whole thing is that there's a song that's been, I've been thinking about and I think of Hannah every time I sing it. Um, it says, how will the people know if we don't tell them? You and I have got a gift of God in our lives. And if we don't tell people, how will they know? And when you see it, because I'll show it to you one day, it's full on 80s with like Lumo socks and rolled up t-shirts and jumpers. And some of you guys weren't even born yet. But anyway, it's awesome, 80 kids. And so the thing is, it's how will the people know? And here Philip is, he's like, how will this eunuch? He's studying the word. He is studying Isaiah. He wants to know. And he's like, I don't know who this guy's talking about. Please, can you tell me? And he goes, okay, that's my opportunity. Right there, I can speak to him about Jesus, that he died for him, that he was going to come as a lamb to the slaughter, that he was going to have no trial, no justice, and he was going to take away the sins of the earth. Right there, he jumps at the opportunity. He goes, I can tell him this guy because I know it. I know that I can answer him. And so he does. And then the next step of events is all of a sudden, just by coincidence, I mean, it wasn't there before. There's a, at that point of time, there's a bit of water. And he goes, can I be baptized? And he says in one of the translations, he says, tell me what I need. What are the requirements? And you can imagine the conversation. Philip goes, all you need to do is believe. Believe that this lamb died for you. Your sins are taken away. And you can be baptized and receive him right now. He goes, sign me up. Sign me up. They stop the chariot, jump into the water, sort it out. Philip disappears. He finds himself in a different area, country, nation, wherever. I didn't look on the, on the map, but he finds himself, I'll tell you where, in Azotus. Nowhere close to the Gaza Strip. And he's gone. All because he was available. All because he, he was willing to go... I'm stepping out of the limelight. I'm stepping away from where everyone's eyes are on me because I'm with the disciples. There's magicians going, can I buy this thing? And people are rebuking him going, how dare you think you can buy the Holy Spirit? And I mean, it's quite an, a heated conversation. And in the bustle and hu- hustle and bustle, God goes, just remove yourself. Go to a quiet space because I've preordained and destined for there to be a person with need and you go to be the person that's going to fulfill that need right now. Just because he went. And that's how God works. He works with little details going, will you go to that road? Because if you go to that road, I'll show you what happens next. When you are are comfortable or not comfortable, when you're obedient and speaking truth to somebody, I'll show you where that can lead to. Because there's no limit to what God can do with an open heart. And an available heart. And that's all he has. That's all he's requiring. And so many times we confuse availability with ability. We go, God, I can't do that. I can't pray out loud. I can't. I was speaking to Myra this week. Myra is a prayer prayer warrior. And she's like, don't ever ask me to pray out loud. I'm like, well, maybe I don't have to. But, you know, people need to come around you. People need to sit around you and just have a conversation with you and hear things that are just in conversation. And that doesn't mean stand up front, have the mic, and now you've got the ability to influence somebody's life. It's what's happening in those moments all over. And when we understand that as a church, you rise up and you start carrying the mandate of Christ going, going into all the world, preaching, teaching for the ministry, loving, doing all these things. He says, that's all of that it's about. Because when you're available, God goes, he will do the, do the rest. We have to remain available and sensitive to what God wants us to do. The other one that I want us to look at is in 1 Samuel 17. It's the Old Testament. It's David and Goliath, one of my children's favorite story. 
one day I'm going to read it to you out of their Bible. So who knows the story of David and Goliath? It's actually become a really famous story. And most people, some people don't even know that it's in the Bible. Some people are just like, this is a really cool story, you know, of warriors and giants being slain. And, you know, the, 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 the baddies lose and the good guy wins, you know, the underdog wins. And so people have used that story not even really realizing it's in the Bible. Like lots of times we quote scriptures that aren't scriptures, but just somebody's. <laughs> like saying, who quoted this scripture? The Japanese. <laughs> so, David and Goliath. Now the Philistines gathered their forces war uh, for war and assembled at Socho in Judah. They pitched camp at all these places. And then Saul and the Israelites assembled the camp in the valley. And they drew up a, a battle line to meet the Philistines. So basically what's happening is the Israelites against the Philistines. The Israelites are God's people. The Philistines are not. And so there's another character in the in the story. His name is David. He's one of um, a bunch of brothers, but he's not in the battle line. He's the youngest, and his three oldest brothers are fighting. And so I'm just going to skip some story, some of the part. And so what happens is his dad, Jesse, says to him, okay, look, you're the shepherd boy. I need you to run a few errands for me. You need to go find your brothers, give them their snack packs and some cheese for the guys in the front line and the, and, and the, the commanders and stuff like that. Get report and bring it back to me so that I can know they're all okay. So he goes, okay, I can do that. Sorts out his responsibilities. He didn't just leave the sheep. He sorts them out, leaves them with somebody else. Does, takes the next step that he was given responsibility and runs across, finds where his b- brothers are camped, leaves the things, goes to the front line, and this is where we're going to be still talk, um, picking up from. So Goliath, and a champion named Goliath who was from Gath, came out to the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and, and a span. He had bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale of armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. This is bigger than the gladiators. Much bigger. On his legs, he wore bronze um, greaves and bronze, and had a bronze javelin um, that was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him, and Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come, up and li- come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? So he thought way more highly of himself. He's like, you're just servants of Saul. I am a Philistine. They were bigger. They were trained warriors. They were fighters. They, so he was like, why would you even try and line up against me? So he's totally intimidating them. We'll probably see that when the all blacks come on the field and whoever they're playing first. It's the same sort of intimidation thing happening. If he's able to fight and kill me, he goes, choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. The whole army was like, this guy's right. Who are we to even think we can take on this, this guy? One guy, not even the army, one guy intimidated them that much. Now, David was the son of um, an Ephrathite, Ephrathite sorry, named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem and Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war, and the firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul and to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So he served Saul already. He just didn't fight in the army, yet he also still served at home. He had errands to run and and watch the sheep. So for 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and said, an evening and took his stand. 40 days. It's not just the beginning of the, the, the battle. 40 days. Every day, these guys are going, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. And he's going, come on, come on. We're not going to move from this place until somebody steps up and takes me on. Now, Jesse said to David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry up to the camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of the unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the Valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up, set out, and Jesse had directed. He reached the camp. 
as the, um, as the army was going out to battle in position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were, still doing everything he was asked to do. Um, as they were talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, everything we just looked at. And David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw that man, they, were, they fled from him in great fear. So they were still wanting to stand their ground, but none of them were willing to take it further. And so this is where it changes. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what? What will be done to the man that can defy or who kills the Philistine and remove this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should even try and defy the armies of the living God? And they repeated to him what they had been saying and told. This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When his oldest brother heard what David speaking to the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you even come here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is, and you came, only, you came down only to watch the battle. Such a random response, eh? Hey? He burned with anger to his brother going, what, what's going on? I also want to know. And then what happens? Now what have I done, said David? You can imagine, these are brothers, eh? Brothers talk like this. What have I done? Why would you even think that about me? Then he turned away and spoke to somebody else. I'm not going to talk to you. I'll just talk to somebody else. And he asked him the same question. And the men gave him the same answer. And then what David did, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul because David was thinking about taking on this guy. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. David was available to run errands. He didn't envy his brothers being in the front line of battle. He didn't say, God, Dad, I think it's a good time for me to be with Saul right now. They, they're all in battle. They're an army. They need me. I need to serve him. He was, he was content going, God, what do you need me to do? If you need me to look after the sheep, I'll look after the sheep. If you need me to run errands, I will look after and run errands. Whatever you need me to do, I'm available because if you want me to do that, God, I'll do that. Now watch how I don't wait. David's place might have been a little bit uncomfortable where God was going to use him. He could have used him in the, you know, in the sheep pen and walking around and somebody could have been lost like the Ethiopian eunuch could have been lost in his um, sort of grasslands and he could have given him instruction and spoke to him. But the way God wanted to speak to David and use David was a bit different to the way he spoke to Philip. He said to him, I'm going to actually use you and take you out of your comfort zone and put you in a place where there is a lot of excitement, where there is all eyes on you, where there." Is everybody going to maybe not believe in you and have something to say about you? A very different scenario. And so his impact or place of impact was a little bit more threatening. Also, he wasn't qualified. He was a young boy. He wasn't in battle for a very specific reason. He actually wasn't old enough to be there in the first place. It might have been overwhelming. You might be in a place where God wants to use you. Why are you going, it's, this is too overwhelming for me. I don't think. It's too big for me. I don't want to go there. Or where you feel you've got no support group or a system to undergird you and help you. His brothers didn't even believe in him. His brothers ridiculed him and said, get away from here. You, you are evil. You are evil and I don't even know why you're here. He was in over his head. But you see, obedience and availability work hand in hand. He was okay to look after sheep. He was okay to run errands of snack packs and cheeses and report back. He was okay to do that. And God said, okay, but because you're available, while you're there, go and do what I've asked you to do. So he was in the front lines. Here's what's going on. And sensitive goes, I can do something about this. I can do something about this. Even though I'm unqualified, I'm too young, I don't have it all together, but I'm not going to sit back and do th and do whatever, you know. The thing is, when you're available, one minute, I'm going to read this because I wrote it down, right, as I was preparing. One minute, you can be running errands for your father, and the next minute, you can be slaying gi giants for a nation. 
You could be just doing the most basic thing out of obedience, which could turn into changing the destiny of an entire nation. One minute, you can just be little old you doing your little old life of little old routine. And then, who has never done any public speaking, but you speak to the language of your sheep and you play on your harp and you sing sing songs to God. And the next minute, you are a spokesperson to the king and you have the ears of people because you were available to just be there. And you can think today, that's not me. And what if God's going, well, what if it is? What if it is? Age doesn't matter to God. So don't think, oh, David was young, I'll use young. Age doesn't matter to God. One minute you can be serving your brothers and the next minute you can be serving a king. One minute you'll be playing with your hobbies, your things that you enjoy, you know, whatever, harps, sheep, killing donkeys and bears and, you know, lions and just playing out with slingshots in the the field. And the next minute, those things that you used as hobbies are used as weapons of warfare. One minute, you can be singing songs in the shower, sitting, walking, singing to, to, um, to sheep or just, you know, having your own quiet little melody in your heart. And the next minute, those songs can be penned down on paper for every person on the planet sing be to to declare them from different nations singing songs that you just pen down out of obedience of what was in your heart i'm talking about the psalms that david wrote he wrote down some psalms just while he was in his own private time with god we use those psalms we sing those psalms we pray those psalms just because he was available to say i can do that one minute you can just be doing your job watching the sheep no biggie Just doing your job, same old, in and out, every day. And the next minute you can be applying your skills and your wisdom to situations that you never even dreamed would come up. You might be in a place today going, why am I doing this? Why am I still here? Why am I going around the same mountain? And then a few few years down the line you go, oh, that's why. Joel referred to it last week as well. He spent years in the NHS. And he's like, why am I still here? Because it was hard going. Now he's using skills what he learned in a whole new environment. So don't despise where you are right now. One minute you'll be walking and talking with God in private behind your closed doors. And the next minute you can be proclaiming him in public. David had a personal relationship with God. And the next minute he's standing before an army going, don't defy my God. Who are you, you uncircumcised Philistine? I know my God personally and you have got no match for him. From cultivating something in secret or in private to being able to call upon it in public. God, I've seen you provide for me in areas that nobody else has. I've seen prayers answered that I haven't been open enough to share with everybody. But right now, God, I have to call on all those things that you've already established in my life to proclaim it for people to see. When we are available, God can do anything with our lives. He's not, ava- he's not interested in our ability It had nothing to do with David's ability. It had nothing to do with Philip's ability. It had to do with his availability. And in that moment, he used what God had. David was a mere boy. He didn't trust in his own strength or fancy armors or weapons. And he didn't even pay much attention to the opinions of his brothers, people closest to him, people that you think would have your back. He was like, God, I'm available for you to use my life. And whatever that looks like, I will do. But his courage and his belief came out of what God said over him. What he believed God said he could do. And because God is all powerful and all knowing, he paved a way. The other thing is, is if you look in verse 39, and I'll read it to you. Um, Saul goes to him and says, yeah, here's my armor. You can use all of it. My shield, my, my helmet, my sword, my everything. You just take it all because nobody was willing to, to take it on, right? And, and so David puts it all on and it says in verse 39, David fastened on his own sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. And then he said, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them all off. He took him, his staff in his hand, chose five stones and the stream and put them in the pouch of the shepherd's bag. When we respond to God, 
He's not going to say, okay, now that I've asked you to do that, let me quickly teach you what you need to know. He's not going to say, now you need to be something you're not. You have to do something that you've never done before. Here's David, and people are going, oh, you need this, you need this, you need this. Let me quickly put my stuff on you. You need to look like the part. You need to play the part. And he goes, I'm not used to all these things. All I know is me. All I know is God. And so right there, that, that sort of excuse going, I don't have it all together, is taken away because God doesn't want us to go as anybody else. He wants us to go as ourselves. God wants us to be available to say, God, it's not about what people put on me or what people expect me to be, but in the moment of who you are, what do you know, and who is God in you? That's all he wants. And in that place, David steps forward and slays a giant. Not because he had the ability to, not because he had all the equipment to, not because he looked the part, played the part, had the training, but because he was available And that's all God requires of us, all of us. It's not about being available to preach on a Sunday because some of us will never stand up here. Some of you will stand up here. But this is not where it's at. This is not where you stand and you make a difference to millions of people's lives. It's in our every single day, being available. And it could be the the silent, the quiet, behind the scenes where nobody sees you, or it could be, you know what, get over your fear. Because right now you're going to make a difference. And that's what makes it even more powerful. God's got a sense of humor, man. He uses people that are shy, who don't need the limelight, and then puts them in the front and center stage. And then he uses people who, who you know, who, who are used to being in the limelight. And he goes, actually, I want to use you behind the scenes. So don't limit him. And don't put an expectation of how he's going to use you. But when you are available, things open up. Those spacious life just saying, that's it, God. Whatever it looks like, he can use you. Amen? Father, I thank you that today, that you are going to teach us and show us, God, how to just wait on you. Dad, can you play the waiting you for you softly? Um, and I thank you, Father God, that as we, as we stop for a minute and just go, God, if we've been too busy, if we've had expectations, if we've even overlooked what you've wanted to speak to us, God, in those places we repent and we say, God, use us. You have a mighty plan for every single person sitting here. God, things that we've already experienced, God, is nothing compared to what you want to show us. And so, God, today we say, have your way in these areas. Teach us to be sensitive to your spirit. Let us not rush through our days, Father God, in a moment as we take that step to the road that is seemingly uninhabited, seemingly empty, seemingly dry, God, that we would wait. God, take us to that place where it's overwhelming and we're overqualified or underqualified and people are, are, are ridiculing us. And if we know we need to stand there, God, strengthen us. Make us brave for the journey ahead. And so, Father God, I pray that as we, we step into this new, new week, into these new seasons, into this new open space, God, we do not want to limit you. And we just say we're waiting for you, God. Speak to us. We make room for you, God. In our hearts, we make room for you in our lives. We make room for you in our finances. We make room for you in our relationships. We, we make room for you to speak and encourage and teach us. And where we know we failed, where we know we don't have it together, God, come alongside and, and speak to us.